Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today we will be talking about RNA-based screening in drug discovery, introducing sgRNA technologies. So today I'm joined by John Moore, who is our Chief Scientific Officer and VP of Oncology. He's been with us since February of this year um, as the CSO, but before that uh, he's been here since 2012. His responsibilities uh, include leading Horizons portfolio of target ID and validation alliances and internal research portfolio. Prior to this, he worked on multiple drug discovery programs at Vernalis, building on his extensive postdoctoral experience in the cell cycle field with Tim Hunt and Sally Kornbach. And his core areas of expertise are in oncology, cell biology, and alliance management. For now, I will pass you over to our presenter, John Moore. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Jonathan. Um, here we're going to, um, this is sort of the agenda for today's presentation. It's going to be a very brief introduction to Horizon Discovery, which is mainly without slides. And then we're going to talk about the Discovery Research Division, where our sgRNA um, screening facility is being established. And then we're going to talk about um, RNA-based screening and drug discovery, the meat of the presentation, um, covering the sort of topics outlined here. Um, so this will include the stuff Horizon's been doing in our, in our collaborations with AstraZeneca. Um, in Gatehouse Park near Boston, and through to the things we're establishing in-house and potential replacements for sRNA technologies. And at the end, we can discuss uh, various ways that you can work with Horizon. So on the next slide, um, we have you know, one of our graphics our wonderful marketing department has put together, which is sort of indicating that now we're in the personalized medicine age. There's a vast amount of genetic information available at low cost. The Moore's law hasn't been uh, found to apply to DNA sequencing, it seems to turn out much better than that. So information is no longer bottleneck, and the emphasis is shifting to what does it all mean. So Horizon has been founded to sort of bring the benefits of this um, DNA sequencing revolution uh, into, uh, into bringing uh, personalized medicine to patients. And we're doing this in various ways, um, but the, the technology of the whole company is built around various methods of genome editing. So we were founded around AAV, which is a way of uh, making molecular combination more efficient. And, and more recently, we've been using uh, zinc finger nucleases and special uh, CRISPR nucleases. And this sort of nucleases is guided by RNA to target particular regions of the cells. And these can be deployed in screening libraries, as we'll see shortly. OK. Um, so genome editing is really editing chromosomal DNA in a specific way. So it's moving away from shRNA knockdown experiments and cDNA overexpression in terms of target validation. So we're looking for more precision, less false positives. So, um, so Horizon now uh, in, employs about 200 people at uh, one site in Britain, two sites, three sites in the US. Um, and we sort of can carry a whole gamut of drug discovery services. What we're going to concentrate on today is at the top target identification with sRNA and now sgRNA screening. But also, other seminars you can look up on our website will um, cover custom astrogenic cell line development, um, sort of drug profiling studies, which we can do on a very sort of high throughput for our combinatorics facility in Boston. Um, uh, my colleague, Kyle Grimshaw, has recently given a webinar on our expertise in complex uh, cell biological assays. Um, and uh, shortly, you'll be able to hear from our colleagues, formerly of SAGE, about ways in which genome editing can be used for rapid animal model generation. So we're building this drug discovery services company. Um, we intend to be as connected to academia and, and the industrial world as possible. Um, so fully share um, as much as possible the, the fruits of our experience. And we're looking to work in partnerships with drug discovery and biotech companies worldwide, and also enable the academic world to uh, employ these technologies, both proprietary ones and, and perhaps more public ones to uh, do their own functional genomics experiments so we can drive biology forward. So the next part of the talk describes sort of our particular approach to RNAi screening um, and synthetic pathology using the x men isogenic cell lines, which is sort of trademark of Horizon. Um, it goes back to probably when one of the early x men films was in the cinema. Um, it stands for Gene X, Mutant and Normal, and uh, it's one of the core things Horizon's been built around. So uh, on the next slide, we're looking at the pan cancer mutation rates, which the TCEG8 consortium has pulled out through their deep, deep sequencing efforts in tumors and cell lines. 
And so what we found as a community, I say I wasn't involved in this, was that uh, this big sequencing effort has identified hundreds of potential driving mutations in cancer. And whether they're driving or not can be picked up based on frequency and the sort of mutations found. And you can also define things as oncogenic or tumor suppressors based on a particular pattern of mutations you've seen. Um, so there are lots of mutations which are bona fide drive on statistical grounds, but many of them are poorly characterized. Um, but if we look at this sort of figure here, you'll see that most of the things have got red boxes around them. And that puts them in the category of either a tumor suppressor, which definitely can't be drugged because it's missing, or hard to drug or impossible to drug oncogenes, things like KRAS, where any sort of small progress um, is met with a massive nature paper, but will these direct methods of, um, of trying to come up with small molecule inhibitors of this complex and important oncogene ever work? Okay. Um, so if we, but you'll see that on this pan cancer mutation rate, the number of things in green boxes, which is topped off by PI3 kinase and um, and VRAP, I think, is rather small. So we've got this predominant problem that most of the cancer-associated mutations are tumor suppressors. They're missing. And the classic way cancer drug discovery has been done in the past hasn't worked for these because we've gone after things like BRAF, PI3 kinase, um, and various types of kinases, and that only um, touches the surface of the problem. So another problem is, is that where we have come up with successful targeted, ther targeted therapies such as femorafenib, um, although our initial responses in many patients have been impressive, the longevity response has been disappointing. Um, so perhaps by going after tumor suppressors, you know, which seem to be the predominantly cancer-initiating cancer mutation, um, maybe some of these problems of differential responses can be overcome. This is a bit of a, you know, a, a thing flow, sort of flown up to be shot down. This may not be true, but the data there at the top um, right-hand corner is from Charles Swanson's uh, studies of, of, of uh, renal cancer, looking at VHL mutations being present in pretty, pretty much every region of the tumor, well, things like set G2 mutations are data events and occur sort of locally. So, if we could target the tumor suppressors, we might make more progress, especially if we started working with things in combinations. But the trouble is, how can you hit something? How can you inhibit something which is missing already? That's uh, a priori impossible. So, what we need to do to get up this sort of vast spectrum of, of cancer drives is to find a different approach. And I mean, this can be called codependency, it could be called synthetic lethargy. But what we want to do is not target the thing that's mutated in cancer directly, but some sort of other protein which now becomes far more important or even absolutely essential in the sort of cancer genetic environment of a tumor cell. And um, the slide here is some sort of one specific classification of, of, of synthetic lethargy where you've got a buffering system, where a mutation in gene A or gene B is tolerated, but both together would be lethal. And so if a cancer cell has a mutation in gene A, merely by targeting gene B, we can uh, eliminate the cancer population, whereas the normal cells, which have got both functional copies of A and B together, will be fine. And in terms of a target ID sort of um, paradigm, this can be done with siRNA screening or SHRNA screening as, um, as an Achilles sort of project that the Road Institute has done. Well, nowadays it can be done with CRISPR. But at Horizon, our, um, our contribution to this problem has been based around an siRNA technology, but also using isogenic cell lines. So if you look at, um, there's a paper published by some, a screening group at the Sloan Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute, which um, looks at the output of, of the Broad group, who's been using the, the Sigma RNA consortium sort of hairpin libraries for target discovery, in, in particularly in KRAS situations, if you think of the classic papers from Claudia Shaw and David Barbie back in 2009. And um, as many of you will be aware, these, these data uh, have not been found to be reproducible in everybody's hands. Um, and, they, and certainly in the STK33 situation, they haven't been translatable into either SIF formats or with small molecules. So, and um, we think there's basically a big problem with noise using hairpins and uncharacterized, um, well, diverse um, panels of, of tumor cells. So non isogenic cell lines, as it says in the gray box, have got hundreds of mutations um, because they're from different patients and the tumor etiology has been different. And they don't have a, no, no, uh, a match normal control. So it's difficult to, to use them to try and find genes which are you know, um, universally associated with a particular KRAS mutation sensitivity. 
So what we favor at Horizon is to use our various technologies to cell engineering to make isogenic cell end pairs. So usually we work with, with tumors and we put another mutation on top, and that's not to everyone's taste. But on occasion, we engineer the likes of MCF10 cells or, or immortalized uh, memory epithelial cells. We have a collection of 550 isogenic cell line pairs, predominantly in oncology. Um, and together, this collection is called the Exoman cell line. And um, should anyone want one, uh, we can make it on a custom basis. Uh, for anyone in academia who is interested in making isogenic cell lines, we can assist you through various programs. So, what we think is that by just screening in pairs of lines, we remove a key source of noise from the isogenic screens. And uh, that's shown on the next slide. So there's a, a vast number of sort of false positives come up with hair from screens, and things are there in some of the lines and not in others. So we think an important simplification in, in isogenic screens, in, sorry, in synthetic lethal screening, is to use isogenic pairs of cell lines. And this is what we're doing in our collaboration with AstraZeneca. So for this uh, work, we've assembled a sort of in-house RNA screening library. It's from commercial reagents made by Dynacon, SmartForce, which are four sort of concentrations. There's four different sRNAs at each target gene delivered in a pool. So at low concentrations, and this is um, uh, philosophic. It's, it's, in principle, this gives lower off-target effects and better knockdown. And we've generally found that to be true when we've done our, um, our follow-up work in-house. So our library is composed of 2,200 druggable genes. It's not the entire druggable genome, but it includes all the kinases, um, uh, a subset of metabolic enzymes, quite a lot of epigenetic targets, various cancer-associated cancer signaling mutations, DUBs, and a lot of DNA damage response genes. Um, so we've, uh, we tend to deploy this screen uh, in a three or four world plate. We've got limited robotics horizon, but it's perfectly fit for purpose. And so we carefully optimize transition, the transfection conditions so we get a bit massive, the maximum differential possible between the non-targeting and the positive cell death controls in the particular cell line. And then we screen our library in, in triplicates or more. We get very good coefficients of variance in this sort of data. And when our screens work well, we get this sort of data. So the blue line there shows the, uh, it's a z-score, which is pretty close to the amount of anti proliferative effects we get, uh, with minus 10 on the z-score being about 100% block of, it, of uh, proliferation. So there's a subset of genes on, a subset of targets on the far left side, which are essential, um, and, and uh, when inhibited in the parental cell line, uh, get, give a massive uh, block and proliferation. But most of the genes in the library have only a modest effect on the growth uh, of the parental cell line. And we, we run the screen simultaneously with uh, an isogenic descendant of the parental line. And we look for things which, uh, we look for targets which, it, whose uh, inhibition of expression leads to selected death in the mutant line, such as those described within the orange uh, oval. And then we take these through a hip confirmation workflow on the next slide. And typically, we follow the following process. We decouple the smart to explore individual constituent siRNAs and then retest the viability of each of these in the isogenic pair, also correlating phenotype with the degree of knockdown by RT-PCR and amino block. So once we've sort of established uh, that single sRNA can be synthetic lethal and is isogenic cell line pairs, we then assess the breadth of synthetic lethality in cell line panels, perhaps five lines in mutation and five lines without. And then uh, for the ones which are most interesting, we go on to rescue the knockdown phenotype with sRNA resistant cDNA. So this is all pretty conventional technology, uh, which is used in academic and industry. And the, the key thing that um, we can bring to it is these isogenic cell line pairs, which makes the screens cleaner, faster, and we sort of feel able to act on quite small differentials and then move into more complex assays, so on the next slide, um, to try and see if we can eat things out. So the next few slides describe um, some of the things Horizon's done around complex assay systems. So one key point is that the size of our library is quite small, 2,200 sort of uh, elements. And this makes it suitable for assessing target dependency under non-standard conditions, because we can work on things like soft agar, lyric reg plate, and spheroids, etc. We've worked hard at working out transfection conditions for this. So one sort of key piece of information, it's 21 years old now, so it's still re relevant. Um, which comes right back from the beginning of using our cell lines. Uh, and Shirasara in Japan 
uh, just published in Science in 1993, um, he knocked out the, both the mutant and the wild type alleles of K-rats in the colon cancer DLD1 cell, and he found that both of these derivative lines grow fine in adherent 2D culture, but the cell line missing the active, activated cancer-associated allele of rats has a massive primitive problem growing in 3D, or as a xenograph in mice. So we've reproduced this, uh, this data many times. Um, we've taken it forward to look at the ability of MEK inhibitors to inhibit the growth of DLD1 cells. And what we find is that DLD1 cells cultured uh, on conventional 2D plastic conditions are more or less immune to the effects of MEK inhibitors. But if you switch them to soft agar, uh, and to some extent sorrows as well, they become a lot more dependent. Um, the thing at the bottom line is the sort of, the thing in the bottom right is the sort of expansion of this to multiple cell lines, tracking the ratio of 2D to 3D ITPC. And what we find is this, this particular sensitivity uh, in 3D maps quite closely to the coding mutation state of the panel, whereas um, the wild type cells, uh, usually the 2D and 3D um, in the inhibition of the MAC is pretty similar. Um, and it's reasonable to say, actually, that the activated view of KRAS is more or less a resistance factor for MAC inhibitor in 2D conditions. And the next slide, we described um, some data we're going to present at the AACR uh, next year on screening a re reasonably small library of exciting synthetic lethal and codependence KRAS targets from the, from the literature in DLD1 cells to try and see if uh, the switch to 3D conditions makes the parental line, which bears this KRAS mutation, uh, more dependent on them. And we're largely finding it is. So the data here, we've got uh, positive control, it's our tox in red, and that sort of lethal under 2D and 3D conditions. And then we've got the negative controls as the blue dots, for which the, um, basically the, the data's been normalized on that basis. So it has no effect in 2D or 3D uh, by definition. And then we've got the, the other uh, SGRNAs and SA, sorry, SIRNAs in the library, and we've got uh, each of the, each point is from each of the sort of dots is from a single data point. So we've got various replicates in here on different plates. So everything yellow is the siRNA against KRAS. So in 2D, this has got a modest sort of 30 to 40 percent uh, drop from uh, of proliferation of DLD ones, and this is distinct from knocking out the activated last allele. This is reducing the expression of both the wild type and the mutant KRAS allele on this line. You can't expect the same thing in fact. But when we switch to 3D conditions, um, we get a more pronounced effect. And we also find that some of the uh, other uh, currently undisclosed components in our library also become a lot more important uh, when the cells are cultured under 3D conditions. So if we move on to the next data slide, this discusses um, siRNA, which I think we're talking about now, with the new sgRNA technology. So, uh, many of you would be aware that there's several limitations with RNA interference. So number one uh, is incomplete knockdown. So clearly this can lead to false negatives, especially when we're dealing with enzymes like kinases, uh, which are notorious for being hard to detect uh, phenotypically in sRNA and shRNA screens. Second is an off-target effect. So by using the Darmacon smart board, we come around some of these problems. And, and generally we found that the synthetic legal hits we found with smart boards have followed through to be repeated by, by at least two of the individual sRNAs in the library. But when you're dealing with shRNA introduced by lentiviruses, these things become more problematic. Um, first of all, there's a swarm of shRNAs. Uh, so shRNAs is a hairpin, and this is sort of cleaved by an endonuclease into various sorts of um, interfering RNAs. Um, but you get a little sort of quasi species of sRNAs in each cell line. And because of the nature of the seed sequence, this leads to different off-target effects um, with each of these uh, sRNAs that have that are made as presence for the shRNA. So this sort of doubles or triples the problem you get with transfecting an sRNA. An shRNA, the advantage of stability and long-lasting knockdown, but it comes with additional off-target effects. And the third problem, if you do go to the sRNAs, is the duration of knockdown achievable. So sometimes we can knock, knock something down for seven days, but more often we see where we do RT-PCR, I say to show in the bottom of the slide, a recovery of the expression of the knockdown target. So in this case, after 96 hours, we see a good proportion of expression recovered. So you, many of you, and as you listen to the webinar, perhaps all of you, will have um, 
had seen Phoenix Sang Feng Zhang's and Eric Land and, uh, and David Sabatini's papers and some of the other ones from the Sanger Institute and also a group in Beijing uh, in nature science and um, nature biotech earlier in the year describing the sort of adaptation of the Cas9 antiviral sgRNA technology to this shRNA antiviral infrastructure um, to enable knockout screens. And they've done several. There's six guanine resistance one and a few cholerotoxin things and also a veriafinib screen. So in essence, the technology works by adapting the tried and tested shRNA technology to deliver not an SSH but a synthetic guide RNA. That's both of the RNA components the bacterial endonuclease Cas9 requires to bind to chromosome DNA and specifically cleave it. And the key thing is these libraries are fairly straightforward to make if you can do recombineering. And so you can make massive libraries and the antiviruses transduce cells to well. And so all you now have to grow up is a population of 10 to 30 million cells. You can put in a 100,000 element library, get hundreds of cells infected with these guys, grow them up in a big pool, um, put some stress on them, uh, and see what's left at the end with, with deep sequencing. So this technology has been used, and despite all of the uh, CRISPR papers describing the ripe of target effects, when it's used in a, a screening context, at least according to public literature, off-target effects don't appear to be a major concern. So the data you're seeing now is from various papers in science. So the indications are that, as you might expect, using a knockout technology is much better at reducing gene expression than a knockdown technology. So this is from Feng Zhang's paper where all six of the guides against SGR, against um, GFP eliminated expression by about a thousand fold, which is better than many of the SHRNAs did. It should be said this is a particularly easy situation. These are HEC293 cells expressing a single copy cDNA of GFP where pretty much any mutation, any indole will inactivate fluorescence. So it's um, a very, very favorable situation for demonstrating the superiority of sgRNAs. Um, but Feng Zhang has also shown, and you'll see our own efforts in this regard later, um, that positive selection screens can identify genes whose inactivation is required for survival under various conditions. So it gives us again data from his science paper um, where two micromolar veriafinib was applied to uh, BRAF mutant melanoma cells for two weeks. Um, so we looked at th those conditions where which will prevent cell proliferation. And uh, the sgRNA library was applied, it knocks out genes and, and cells which now have a proliferation advantage will accumulate in the population and the guides become more abundant. So this can be sequenced. And this experiment can be done with both sgRNA and shRNA technologies. And according to Feng Zhang's paper, um, all four of the guides against NF2, NF1, and MED12, which are all tumor suppressors, um, accumulated significantly in the population uh, that has been treated with veriafinib, while only a minority of the uh, of the hairpins against the same target came through. But it's not all sweet lips and light. Um, the land of Sabatini paper uh, would suggest that negative selection screen, which is of course is what you want to do to discover a uh, novel synthetic lethal target, may be problematic. So. What the Land and Sabatini group did was uh, they made every single guide possible against the 200 or so ribosomal proteins uh, and put them all into a big pool and uh, along with uh, I think five or six guides against uh, most of the rest of the human genome. They did a big dropout screen in diploid KBM7 cells and um, sorry haploid KBM7 cells and diploid HL60 cells and the results are strikingly different. Um, in the haploid cell line, the, the typical guide against the ribosomal protein was depleted by minus 2 log 2, so about fourfold depletion, okay, which is uh, okay, but not, not spectacular perhaps, but that's just the average performance. Uh, it's known that different guides activate CRISPR with different efficiencies. In HL60 cells, which are diploid, um, things were less good. Of course, there's, there's more copies per gene here, so you'd expect things to be harder. But here, the average, ribos the average guide against the ribosomal gene only dropped out by about uh, 1.5 fold. So that will mean you have to have an exceptionally good experiment um, and a pretty much robust analysis pipeline to take to follow these sort of potential synthetic lethal hits on, or you'll have about 3,000 potential candidates to, to 
chase from the stream, which is rather too many to deal with. Um, the Land of Sabatini paper also describes the generation of a second generation library, um, which indicates that performance of these screens could be better. So here they took the hundreds of guides they had against ribosomal proteins and bin them either to, to ones that depleted well from the population and ones that depleted poorly. And they got their machine learning algorithm to run in their computer to come up with um, some sort of equation which defines, which takes the, the RNA sequence and says whether it's good or bad. Um, I don't think they published that algorithm, although other competing algorithms have become available in the public domain. And, uh, but nevertheless, they were able to design a better second generation library um, where they were able to deplete uh, the non ribosomal set of, of essential genes uh, by a greater average fold than the original library. So that indicates there's room for improvement. So um, on the next slide, we want to state that the horizon intends to be at the forefront of guide design. Uh, so we want to be big in CRISPR. We've got some of the luminaries and future Nobel Prize winners, although that is a forward-looking statement, which I shouldn't make really, um, onto our scientific advisory board. We've got Emmanuel Charpentier from Vienna, uh, and Keith Young and Fen Zhang from, um, from Boston. And each of them are experts in various technologies, in, including uh, in Feng Zhang and Keith Young's case, uh, talons as well. And so we've also built a relationship with a tech, uh, sort of technology startup, Desktop Genetics, based in London, who have built this sort of um, user-friendly guidebook tool for um, guide design, which is um, the architecture of this means that the latest uh, advances from this can be incorporated into design of second and third generation libraries. And we're doing things like accessing the merits of this sort of library of the algorithm from uh, Dench and colleagues. Uh, last year, David Root published in Nature Biotech back in 2014. And we're also um, through a relationship with uh, Vienna-based company Haplogym, uh, also exploring access for Horizon to haploid cell lines. Um, so where because as you saw on the previous slide, the KBN7 cells were, gave much better results in HL60. So we're going to be in examining to see if uh, haploid cells are going to be better for the discovery of synthetic lethal targets. So um, the next few slides are just going to describe actual results we've recently got hot off the press at Horizon um, to establish our sgRNA screening capabilities. Um, so the first to say what we have. So we have built our own version of Feng Zhang's um, second generation libraries, one published in the Sanjin paper in 2014. So this is 122,000 guides, and it's got six per every gene in the human genome, uh, 1,000 odd negative controls, um, target demo RNAs as well. And it comes in sort of two bits, part A and part B, which we tend to use together. Um, we've built this uh, library in our version of Feng Zhang's P Lenti CRISPR V2, the single vector system, but we would be able to clone this library or other libraries we should make on a custom basis into the two vector system, which is going to have advantages for hard to infect cells. Um, and we're, we're running experiments at the moment. We've got our data back from the first two, though only one of them's in, in the slide sets. But in addition to this whole genome library, we also built uh, 2,300. Um, guide library, which contains 21 guides versus each of 100 genes. So, because we're interested in KRAS, we put 29 extra targets in uh, that have been shown to show synthetic authority or codependence with that particular cancer-associated mutation, but also 21 tumor suppressors, uh, which are defined based on mutation spectrum, which is described by the science paper from last year. So, these 21 guides come from the Lambda Sabatini, from Fang Zhang's V2 library, and also from some mainly manually desired ones we've, we've put together using our guidebook software. So we're running some of the screens that have been described in literature, uh, first with the small library, then with the big library, and what we're going to do is try and work out how we design experiments to have the greatest confidence of identifying synthetic lethal targets, because that's not something that's really been uh, done in any of the papers published so far. Um, so what we envisage making is a second generation library targeting the same subset of genes as we have in our synthetic sRNA library. Um, so this is an experiment we did, which is, uh, we got the results of a couple of weeks ago. It was A375 cells uh, treated very rapidly as, as was one of the experiments in the Shalom Science paper. So we uh, worked out a concentration of PLX4032 uh, equals very rapidly, which would more or less address um, arrest cell proliferation in the 14-day period. 
Um, we transduced uh, ooh, 20 million cells um, with our library, which means we have 8,500 cells transduced with each guide RNA. Um, we select them pure life in six days and then enable them to expand either the presence of DMSO or the presence of DM of berarachnid to identify genes which are accumulated or dropped out in the face of this agent. So um, this is some box plots in our data. So um, we get sort of a, a reasonable amount of reproduced diversity between duplicate samples. We see some things dropping out, uh, which are presumably essential genes. And in the day 14 PLX sample, we see a subset of guides uh, accumulating significantly in the population. So we've got more than 100-fold enrichment for three of the guides, out of 21, I should say, against NF1, and 10-fold um, enrichment, five out of 21 guides for NF1, five out of 21 for NF2, and a couple of others as well. So uh, this is a scatter plot looking at the, on the left-hand axis is the log2 abundance in um, raffinid tree cells, and on the x-axis is the sort of abundance um, in the DMSO treated cells. So it's a scatter plot, and the things at the top of the graph are accumulating by more than 100-fold, okay, and those are three NF1 sgRNAs, and most of the things in boxes are either additional NF1 or also NF2 sgRNAs. On the next slide, uh, we plot the log2 ratios post berenafenib for all 21 guides against NF1 or NF2 after treatment with flexicon compounds, and we see that quite a few of the guides against NF1 or NF2 do accumulate, but it, we're not getting as striking results as Feng Zhang did. Um, it's so the, the red uh, uh, guides are from a Feng Zhang library, but it's, to be fair, it isn't exactly the same library as he did his first science paper with. Um, we have looked at which guides have accumulated uh, in this experiment and, and tracked that back to the ones that, that he published back in science, and there's a reasonable correlation between them. But we also get good performance at the Land Sabatini library, and our custom library, uh, our, our custom sort of five guides uh, gave variable performance. So I'm only showing NF1 and NF2 here, but we've also tracked um, the same number of guides against a small set of essential genes as well. And we get quite variable responses. But what you get is a lot of blandness um, of things which are sort of in the noise, and then you get some standout things coming through. Uh, we just today I saw the results of a screen where we applied this same small library against um, six thiaguanine as Landa Sabatini did. Um, MSH1, MSH2, and MLH2 have come through very strongly as selected guides. Uh, in some cases, accumulating 200 to 500 times uh, in the six thiaguanine treated population compared to um, the DMSO treated population. So what we can do is we can say with quite high confidence that this technology does work the first or second time you try it. It, uh, it doesn't come necessarily with spectacular results. So we need to, um, we're going to use this data to design robust experimental paradigms where even under non-optical conditions, um, we're going to have enough depth uh, of guides in our library so that targets do come through in an unambiguous way the first time the experiment's done. Um, but the technology definitely works for pulling out uh, resistance factors, and we're working hard to see how useful it's going to be uh, in sensitivity screens. Okay, so the next slide is moving from screening here to target validation. So let's imagine a situation um, where you've done a screen, it hasn't worked so well, and you've just got a single guide uh, RNA um, pointing towards the target. So it looks interesting, it may even make sense, but you've screened 20 guides at the same target and only one has come through. What do you do? Um, with an SHRNA, I think um, the consensus is you wouldn't bother. But with this new technology, um, and a very different, and we, we, we've, we've made a lot of cell lines using CRISPR, and we see a very different performance string guides. Um, and that's when we're using transient transfection to have high concentrations of everything, which will drive things um, you know, aggressively forward so that non-optimal guides will work. But an sgRNA um, in lentiviral context, we're expressing from single copy promoters, um, which aren't the strongest CMV1 we use in cell engineering. So this is the sort of situation which is going to sort the, uh, the sheep and the goats, uh, sgRNA-wise. So if you have got a single here, exemplified by, you know, by just one 
SQLA, what do you do? And we would say, try again. We repeat full screen. So these can be made pretty fast. Um, you may want to include other pathway elements. Uh, so a lot of kinase involved in citrus transduction pathways. And in many cases, there's a sort of canonical diagram on the um, cell signaling sort of website that will tell you which other um, things to throw in. So if you're dealing with full libraries, uh, you may as well screen 1,000 and screen 10. These, these things aren't too difficult to put together. You put, have to put the effort into learning how to recombinate and make 90-hour libraries. And um, that lets you, probably with a 10-week turnaround, get back at the experiment and do it again and see if you're going to get a bigger signal. Um, if you do, it's then worth moving to world-based validation because this is where you can look at the phenotypes going on, especially if you've got a high-content screening platform. Um, so if that works, you then might go, if you're dealing with cancer in the central genes, and uh, we'll see in a moment what real data on a world-by-world world looks like, um, you might ask, is there a doubt about the penetrance of the phenotype? Well, if not, um, you might want to move on and look at, see whether some sort of druggable site is going to be involved in this activity, um, with a positive result leading to drug discovery down on the right. But if um, you're not sure about the penetrance of the phenotype, whether it's got a big enough effect, um, you can assess whether the target's essential. And Horizon have worked out this sort of um, mechanism of going through some aspects of our cell line engineering process to work out whether a cell line could be made or not. So on the next slide, we've got some of our well-based validation experiments. So um, we've been working for a while with HG Biomedicine in Boston at Target Validation Alliance. And a couple of years ago, uh, we were interested in uh, whether RAF1 was essential for KRAS-initiated lung, lung tumors. Um, has been have been shown independently by Mariano Barbasid in, in Madrid and David Toothson in Cambridge, England at the time. And so um, we use SHRNA technology in this sort of experiment. Our results, in spite of uh, using multiple assays for target, seed bay rescues, large cell line panels were horrifically ambiguous. And there was extreme frustration to put so much work in and not be sure what the result was. So we were very keen to try the SGRNA technology um, in this uh, regard as well. So we applied five guides against RAF1 to A549, which is lung cancer cell line and KRAS mutation, along with um, a host of negative controls, of which we put ROSE26 on this slide. So what we see, um, so these are lentiviral transductions with single S sgRNAs uh, drawing individual wells, and we look at, we're just looking for proliferation phenotype here, using the inky site over 168 hours or so. And we find that parental cells, which are shown in the darker blue, they, they grow at a certain rate exponentially for a while, and then they reach confluence and tail off. And we find that the ROSA26, so this is a, a validated guide with no cuts, targeting a non-essential locus, um, does produce some antiphysical phenotype. In another experiment we've done subsequently, we found some guides uh, which have no phenotype at all and overlap with the parental. So we are sort of seeing, I suppose, some evidence that the expression of some guides against um, non-essential genes does have a phenotype, and this may represent some sort of off-target effect of the guide. Um, so we're looking into this. But the, the five uh, sgRNAs against RAF1 all have a more pronounced effect um, than the ROSE26 one did. And we're now uh, looking to see what's happened at the... Um, at the genome level, when we've applied these um, sgRNA lentiviruses uh, to A549 cells, look at the level of editing we have, and whether the survivors still express CRAF or whether they don't. Um, so in terms of is my target essential, as I, as I said a couple of minutes ago, we devised this medium throughput method. So this works like this. We would deliver uh, lentiviruses with, um, loaded up with Cas9 and sgRNA. Uh, versus the target interest of cells, and then we'd allow about three weeks of gene editing to occur. Okay, so we, we have this population where editing is hopefully done to completion. And we then split this into single cells and culture the colonies up to one or two thousand cells from each of these hundreds. And then we're going to use our genome engineering um, expertise to see what's happened to the multiple alleles of, of the target locus. Okay, so the first step we do um, the restriction digest, we perhaps choose a four cutter, uh, which is going to be close to the PAM site of the sgRNA, and therefore, if editing occurred, we'd expect it to be disrupted. We'd amplify PCR products, uh, flanking this restriction site, and compare what happened in the subsequent clones to parentals. This is sort of first pass, 
And then for the ones that look interesting, we then run them, uh, these PCR fragments, through a fragment analyzer, which is a sort of sub-base pair resolution um, capillary electrophoresis system. And uh, this enables us to look at, because we're working with clones here, um, all of the alleles of the gene at the same time. And because we've got this sub-nucleotide resolution, we can ask whether an indole has been produced is one nucleotide, two nucleotides, or three nucleotide multiples of the length. Okay, so if we, in our subsequent clones, we only find in-frame indels, that's very strong evidence to target the central. It means we haven't been able to make a functional knockout. In contrast, if we find uh, colonies which contain frame shift indels, um, that would indicate that we, if we find, and the important thing is that we can find a colony which contains a frame shift indel on all the alleles of the gene, presumably the minority of them. If we find that, that's very strong evidence the target non-essential, and we have made a functional knockout. And this is going to be a more hybrid technology than looking at things through immune blocks. It's not going to be restricted to cell lines of good antibodies. And when we work uh, at talking about PCR, we should be able to get around the necessity of being able to culture colonies from single cells as well. So we think we've got a reasonably hybrid method to assess whether my target's essential. So the next thing you want to know in terms of setting up a drug discovery program is is it one of those notorious scaffolding roles, and I've certainly been bitten by these in the past, or is it a bona fide target with a small molecule, or a sort of you know, agonistic antibody, or whatever it may be, may be able to um, uh, inhibit it functionally. So we've had this gene editing technology for a while, and we partnered with one kind of program with AstraZeneca up in Cheshire uh, a year or so ago, and key to that partnering was an experiment where we did uh, two rounds of gene engineering to introduce um, uh, lysine to alanine mutation in the uh, undisclosed kinase uh, under discussion. And this enabled the cells to grow in 2D, but had a pronounced 3D effect. So we were able to make it via the knockout. We didn't use, use fancy conditional alleles. And um, so this was key to getting a partner, because it, it sort of provided quite good evidence that small molecule inhibitors would have the same effect as knockout. A knock in equals knock hit. If knock in equals knockout, then small molecule may do what you want it to do. So, but this took a long time, and I think for our potential pharma partners, we're looking at ways to make this quicker. So, we have worked hard at Horizon to characterize uh, our proprietary AAV technology and having this be employed with other um, gene editing methods. And we've got this experiment which uses a rather special little of GFP. Um, which I won't really go into. We call it the fire line. It's, um, it's where the cDNA has been divided into artificial exons, and this sort of reduces noise you get from the early transduction. So we can knock in. Um, we can use the, the AAV system or plasmids or oligonucleotides to introduce donor DNA um, into a cell line where we've got essentially a GFP which is broken by mutation, and then we're hoping to fix this using whatever the nucleotide, the plasmid, or the AAV. Um, as a template for homology directory repair. And so all we simply have to ask is how many cells become green in a flow cytometer. And uh, what we find in this is that oligos were, at least one of these, ones, these things, were a completely hopeless template for, uh, for homology directory repair. A plasmid worked, but nowhere near as well as we expected. Uh, and we got the fantastic uh, re results with AAV using wild type Cas9. Um, an AAV donor repaired green fluorescence in 1% of cells, and using the sort of NICase D10A mutant, which doesn't make a double-stranded break, just a single-stranded NIC, we got 3.4 cells per cell of cells converted to green fluorescence. I need to emphasize this is done without antibiotic selection. So you can, you can drive this much, much higher efficiencies if you're prepared to put antibiotics in your donor cassettes. And now um, that's what we're doing. So we've designed these sort of various paradigms to take a drug target of interest and in a single step um, uh, introduce you know, conditional mutations into one allele and trust the other allele with CRISPR. And now on the next slide, hopefully, my computer's jammed, but yours is working, that's good. They, um, we can see some sort of results from a highly analogous experiment we've just recently done. And in this case, we're using DLD1 cells, which is diploid. And um, there's, there's two alleles of the gene of interest. So we've introduced um, an AAV vector, either with wild type Cas9 or mutant Cas9. And we've been able to get, in some cases, 
uh, nearly half of the cells which have um, antibiotic resistance have a non-target integrin. And um, we then took those and um, did some carefully designed PCR oligos, tried to see what happened to the non-targeted allele. And we found several clones where there was either um, a one or a two nucleotide deletion, or as shown here, a much bigger deletion, uh, which takes out pretty much the whole exon. So now we think we can go in a single step in, say, three or four months, at least with the more engineerable cell lines, um, and do an, a genome editing to knock in and, all, and, and create an all allele um, knock-in mutation, uh, which will be good for probing uh, and, and sorting out what's going to be the good drive targets for the ones which aren't going to work. And uh, I think that, uh, oh, he has more slides. So the, I think one, as a little coda to that bit, I wanted to talk about um, sgRNA screening, not just being for knockouts. Um, so these are data recently published by Jonathan Weissman's lab at UCSF, which you can read about in cell. Um, the fly here is just, we're going to establish technology at Horizon as well, or perhaps the variant of it um, recently published by Feng Zhang. And um, so what this does is um, we've taken the sort of experience as a field with game with talent, um, you know, which they can be repurposed. If we remove the nuclease from talent and replace it with some transcriptional um, control domains, like the VP64 from, um, from the virus or, or, the, or the crab domain, um, from uh, a well-known transcription repressor, we could sort of make a sequence-dependent uh, transcriptional activator or transcriptional repressor. Now, this technology was very quickly adapted to um, the Cas9 nuclease um, because everyone appreciated this RNA-guided nuclease would make it very efficient. And so we, um, back in 2013, constructs with BP64 or, or CRAB have been well published. And now, in the last couple of months, um, this has moved on, and these constructs have been used for whole genome library screening. And the, the graphs on the right uh, come from Jonathan Weissman's cell paper, uh, where he's looking at genes involved in um, uh, cholera toxin resistance and sensitivity. And the key thing is that it seems with the system, you know, with both positive and negative uh, manifestations of it, to modify gene expression over a 10 to 1,000 fold range, depending on the gene. Uh, Feng Zhang's recent paper, um, which is mainly looking at the activation of expression, can take things further, and sometimes up to 15,000-fold expression. It looks like most genes you try and um, this will, will will respond. It's not going to work with ones which are broken, but it does seem to overcome a lot of epigenetic impression and, um, you know, and uh, lineage responsive genes. So now this looks like it's going to become both, a, this technology looks like it's going to be a replacement for both SHRNA screening, um, if you can deliver it in lentiviruses, but it's probably going to have low off-target effects, or also cDNA libraries. Um, because if you can activate the expression of a gene with a little RNA, um, it's just a powerful way of looking at drug resistance, etc. And Horizon fully intends to provide these as services for our clients, also get some research collaborations going on these in 2015. Next slide, please. Um, that describes more of the same. We can move on from that one. Um, so one thing we want to emphasize uh, of special interest to our um, industrial audience here is that when you work with Horizon, we've got the IP for the CRISPR estate covered. So if you look at the field, Derek Lowe in, in the pipeline wrote a blog on this recently, and I think there's been an article in Nature Biotech. But the IP situation regarding CRISPR and Cas9 is complex and rapidly evolving. I understand universities involved in the IP are suing each other already. Um, it's very unsavory. Uh, key, clearly, as a CRO, we're very keen to make this easy for people who want to work with us. We want to ensure freedom to operate for our, um, our client portfolio. And so we can align the three main patent estates as we see them. So Horizon's got licenses to the um, George Church Harvin patent estate, to the Emmanuel Champetier estate, um, and also the Feng Zhang estate. And if other IP is needed, we will secure it. We've got relationships and, and options uh, in place for these sort of things. And we've also got this guidebook in silico design software, which we're going to keep up to date. Uh, so our library is going to be efficient, and this is of particular interest to academic partners as well. Next slide, please. And um, again, again, it's mainly the industrial audience here. Uh, there's various ways you can work with Horizons. We are a, uh, a CRO, which we can work on a fee-for-service basis, large or small products. 
but we're also interested in um, more collaborative work where we can either do it at cost or in special cases we can even work below cost in a full risk share alliance. So that slide shows the various ways you can work for Horizon. I refer you to other webinars um, on our website, um, other uh, sort of uh, flyers and literature we have, and we're also obviously willing to, um, to for people to contact us and open discussion about ways we can work in the future.